else or from somewhere else that's not the US, but we will bring it, I guarantee we will bring it back um, through the course of the discussion. So yeah, I'm gonna go a little international. Um, uh, and this is an outline of, of what I'd like to talk about. I'd love, like, I, I really wanna offer an introduction into what, what I like to call legal empowerment. And I'm gonna talk about what I think of as the three transformations that are at the core of legal empowerment. Secondly, the legal empowerment cycle. And thirdly, some lessons from experience about community paralegals in particular. So those are the big, big um, topics for the day and the big things that I hope you will take away by the end of this. Um, but let me start with Kenya. Has anybody ever been to Kenya? This is where it shows up on the map on the Horn of Africa. Anybody been, any ever been, anybody ever been to Kenya? I hope one day when we can travel again, Bernadette has, yeah, that, that um, some of you will make it there. Here it is on the Horn of Africa between um, Ethiopia and Somalia on the north and the east, and then Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda to the west and the south. And about 60% of the land mass of Kenya is made up of grazing land. And that's basically like everything that you see in this map that's yellow, those are grazing lands. And Maasai and other herding communities, many of you would have heard of the Maasai, that's one tribe and there are other Samburu, there, there are other tribes um, that are similar. They have depended on that land for centuries, but they have never had legal rights to govern it. Um, and I know you guys are focused on housing. In a way, land is a precursor for housing. For many people around the world, if you can't hold on to your land, you can't hold on to your house. Um, and so as a result, because these folks have, have ha not had legal rights to the land that they depend on and live on, they have been extremely vulnerable to theft and exploitation by mining, by agribusiness, by conservationists actually who have been land grabbers at times, um, by big, large infrastructure projects that government has sponsored and by other in industries. And um, I would just say that these herding communities, they coexist with the wildlife that you might um, see in children's books. I'm a dad and so it show shows up all the time in the, the kid books I read my kids. Animals like lions, giraffes, zebras, gazelles, warthogs, um, they, they have co coexisted historically with these herding communities. And if these grazing lands are fragmented and converted to industrial use, neither that wildlife nor the pastoral way of life that they have lived um, for, for centuries will survive. So um, there are both human and environmental stakes in, in relation to what happens to these grazing lands in Kenya. And in 2016, Kenya adopted something called the Community Land Act, which is a law that for the first time makes it possible for pastoral communities to secure legal rights over their lands. And that, that law was actually required by the, the Kenyan constitution, which was passed in 2007. It, it was hard won. It was a long battle that led to passing that Community Land Act. But once it got passed, um, and this is not entirely uncommon, government did nothing to implement it. To date, not a single community in the country has received legal rights under that act um, as of now, to 2020. This woman, her name is Matito, Matito Leriso, and she's from a place called Lengurama in Isiolo County in the center of Kenya. And in 2017, she had never heard of the Community Land Act, but she did hear that people nearby her had been forced from their homes because the Kenyan government was laying power lines on their land. And she also heard that government wanted to run an oil pipe pipeline across the country um, that might pass through her land. And she said, you know, I, I have never left this place. I have lived here all my life, but I have lived always with the fear of being chased away. So, you know, there she is living on land that she's, she's occupied all her life. And in practice on the, I'm oh, sorry, not in practice, on the books, there is a law that would protect her rights to that land but she's never heard of that law and government's done, done nothing to implement that law. Matito is not alone. 
law is supposed to be the language we use to translate dreams about justice into living institutions that hold us together. Law is supposed to be the difference between a society ruled by the most powerful and one that honors the dignity of everyone, strong or weak. But that is not the world we live in. I was a member of a um, international task, for, task force on justice that convened over the last year and it was co-chaired by ministers of justice from the Netherlands and Sierra Leone and Argentina. And we looked at data from over 100 countries and we estimated that worldwide there are 5.1 billion people who face grave injustices that they cannot remedy because the systems for delivering justice are broken or repressive or both. And I thought I would pause here Vivek, thank you for pausing. Something's going on yeah. with your sound. Uh, you're okay. coming loud and soft, so if you can do something to correct that. Okay. okay. I wonder if, how about now, if I bring it a little closer? Does that sound better? Okay. Yeah, please do interrupt me if I go out again. Was I more or less, um, could you guys kind of make out what I was saying? Okay. Um, I, I wanted to pause for a moment and just ask you guys all to remember a moment when you experienced injustice personally, or you witness an injustice against others, maybe just take a couple moments to jot down some lines about that memory. And in particular, what I'm interested in is what role did law play in that experience of injustice? What, what role did law play? Anybody wanna briefly share? They'll all put their response in the, in the chat. They're all working on it now. Okay. I would also welcome if someone wants to share verbally. I'm trying to open up the chat. Let's see where to go. Here it is. Um, yeah, any, anybody wanna, um, wanna say out loud at, uh, an experience that you experienced yourself or, or that, you, that, that someone close to you or something you witnessed? Don't be shy, you guys. And the other thing that I would ask is that when you do speak, if you could um, just tell me your name. So we start to get to know each other. Wow. Joe, you want to just describe that out loud? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I have been uh, at, a, at a number of protests, mm -hmm. um, some pretty uneventful in terms of interactions with police, but mm -hmm. uh, a number of them, especially in late May, early June, that uh, there was a lot of violence from police. Um, I think there's there's actually a hearing ongoing right now about the consent decree. Um, so I guess that is sort of a way that the the law is is um, playing out here. But the, mm. thus far, you know, from what I've seen, police kind of act the same at all these protests. So. Mm. When they do beat protesters, it's deep because they are the law. That, that's the thing about the police is that they, they embody the law. So what they do carries so much meaning, um, both physically and symbolically. Uh, thank you for sharing that. How about, um, how about Deborah or Deborah Medina? Yes, Deborah. Deborah. Thank hey. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so yes, I was at a Texas detention center this past January, um, helping women and children from Mexico and Central America with their asylum claims, mm. uh, with immigration. And it was just the fact that uh, these agents were not following the law or uh, giving them the adequate time to prepare for these interviews, um, which is in, in the law that they, they're supposed to be given a chance to argue their case. Mm. And they weren't being given that opportunity. Correct, yeah. 
That sounds like a searing experience. Yes, um, to say the least, yes. Maybe we'll take just one more. Um, um, I'm just looking through. Teddy? Hello. Yeah, hey. we, we were protesting downtown. I volunteer with mm. Chicago's oldest boys and girls club, um, mm. called Off the Street Club in West Garfield Park. Mm. And our, our kid, Malcolm, was totally keeping to himself. He's notorious for being the most peaceful, kind-hearted young man. And mm. the cop, seriously, in my opinion, lunged at him and broke his arm, and he spent two nights in jail. Yes. Um, we actually, we have video of him getting out of jail and there, we had at least 200 people outside of mm. the prison waiting for him. And it was, uh, I'm going to try and find that video and mm. send it because it's, it's, it's very powerful. Mm. Well, so similar to Joe's and, and something that's been happening all across the country over the last few months, um, I've been out there in the streets too. Well, thank you for sharing those. Let's, let's remember those. And I know there were a couple that people wrote down that I, we didn't hear from and maybe a few more coming. Let, let, let's remember those, those examples. We're going to come back to them. But in the meantime, let me say something about legal empowerment. Legal empowerment is an approach to tackling injustice. And it's about taking the power of law out of books and courtrooms and putting it in the hands of ordinary people. And Legal Empowerment aims to transform the relationship between people and law in three ways. The first you might call knowledge that it's, a, you know, for many people, the law is distant, it's complex, it's even mystical sometimes. And the goal of Legal Empowerment is to demystify it, to turn it into something that you can understand, that anybody can understand, rather than it being this technical, complex, opaque thing, um, that it's something that you can make sense of, so knowledge. Second transformation is about um, agency. I lived, in, um, I lived in Sierra Leone for, for four years. That's kind of where I cut my teeth on legal power. I, I still go back every year, though. I, I missed last year. All right, I, I was supposed to go earlier this year. I missed it because of the pandemic. Um, but if you go to a lawyer's office in Freetown, and you come, you know, you sort of share your problem. The, the, the lawyer will listen to you and then he'll say, okay, I don't hear you. Left the money, le left the money at the table. Me go handle them for you. Like, leave your money, leave some money on the table. I'm going to handle it for you. I've got you. Which is, you know, not that different. I'm speaking from Washington, D.C. right now, which is where I live now. Not too different from what a lawyer in Washington, D.C. would say. You know, I'm, I'll, I'll, I've got you. I've, I'll solve this for you. The message of legal empowerment is a little different. You know, it's not that I'm going to solve it for you, but it's rather that um, we'll solve it together. And I'm going to I'm going to make you to be in a stronger position so that you can solve like these things like this yourself. I'm not going to advocate for you. I'm going to support you to advocate for yourself. Um, so agency is a second kind of transformation that, that legal empowerment is after. And then the third one is about governance. It's about um, not only can I take action to, to address the problem that I'm facing right now, that I can take part in shaping the rules for all of us. Um, and so another way of thinking of those three transformations, can you guys still see the slides? I'm gonna move over my chat box. Um, another way of thinking about those three transformations knowledge, agency, and governance is no law, use law, shape law. That, that, that's the vision of legal empowerment, that everybody should be able to do those three things, no matter who you are. Um, and that's very different from the reality of law for most people around the world, not the way we experience law now. And really, I think ultimately, this represents a deeper version of democracy. When all of us are doing all three of those things, it's a deeper, more engaged, more alive version of democracy. Um, so let me come back to Matito, put the slide back on. Um, the woman to her right is named Felister Monti, and she's from Lengurama too. She's from the same place. And she works as a community paralegal with Samburu Women's Trust, which was founded 
by a Samburu woman, by a Samburu woman named Jane Meriwas. And Pulitzer and her teammates at SWT spent two years supporting the people of Lengurama to understand what the Community Law Land Act says, that law that I mentioned that was adopted in 2016. They helped folks in Lengurama to understand what, that's, what, that, what the contents of that law, and then the, to follow the steps that the law lays out, which include documenting, documenting the boundaries of your land, adopting rules for governing that land, electing land management committees, um, and Matito was really involved in that process. In fact, she ended up getting elected to that land management committee, um, which was a huge deal because um, historically, Samburu women have not had a role in questions about land governance, like how do we manage our grazing lands? When should people be able to bring their cattle to which place? What do we want to do if an outsider or an investor comes and is interested in land? Those are all questions that exclusively men would answer. Um, but the Kenyan constitution requires um, one third women representation on those committees. And so because they were following the steps of the law, Felicer explained to the community that if we want to get our land rights under this national law, we're going to have to have one third women on the new land management committee and, and uh, Matito got elected. And I think of everything that, 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 has been transformative for her. She said, I, we just used to not be invited um, when men would talk about these things. And now I am at the heart of those conversations. And in fact, in adopting bylaws for the management of Lengurama's lands, um, there were two rules that she posed specifically, one involving a, a fine violating um, grazing lands that they reserve in, in the, to, to make sure that there's some grass left over if they have a drought um, and a prohibition on building homes close to the river so as to protect the river quality. These were things that Matito herself sort of initiated as rules and ended up getting adopted by the whole community and written down for the first time, um, which, was a, which was a big deal for her. So the community was hard at work. For Lister, the community paralegal, and, 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 and the people from this place were following all the steps that the law laid out for them. But in the meantime, over the course of the same two years, the Kenyan government did not a thing. They did nothing. Um, and so late last year, representatives from 11 communities across the country who had gone through this same process traveled to Nairobi and they marched to the Ministry of Lands. I think I have a photo of that march. Um, and uh, Matito Larissa was one of them. She had never visited Nairobi before. She wore those regal rings of beads from her neck to her shoulders that are traditional for her, um, as she does on most days. And she presented an application on behalf of Lengurama, the place in Northern Kenya where she's lived all her life. And she said, we, we have worked hard two years to produce this um, to the officials that she met. And she said, I'm not going back home with this thing. You know, it's th this application, you're gonna take it from me. I'm not going back home with it. And that, that march was covered in major newspapers and TV programs and under pressure from what in Swahili are called the Wananchi, the ordinary people, the ordinary citizens, government agreed to process the applications within four months. This was late last year before the um, pandemic. We haven't, the, the communities have not yet received the deeds that they are eligible for under the Land Act, so that promise has not been kept. But um, some big things have happened since that March. The ministry set up a committee to implement the law for the first time. Um, and most importantly, they hired 24 community land registrars who are administrative officials at the local county level that are necessary to process applications from across the country. So it's, it's sort of the first major move that the government has made to implementing this law that it had adopted, but that was just sort of sitting there fallow um, on the books. And so I wanted to ask you guys, um, and you can put thoughts in the chat or you can just speak up, we're not that big of a group. Um, do you, in, in this little story that I told, do you see those, those three transformations I mentioned happening? And, and how, if so, how? And I'm gonna...
it's powerful to see these other examples of injustices. But yeah, no law, use law, shape law. Were, were those three things happening in the story I told? Does anybody want to describe how? You can just go ahead and unmute yourself and speak up. But tell me your name when you begin. Anybody? You can feel free to call on people. <laughs> should, I, should I take it there? No law, no shape law. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Who's that? Hi, this is James Long. Hey, James. Um, so for knowing the law, uh, finding out about the Community Land Act was mm -hmm. the first step to doing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, using the law, uh, once you understand that law, uh, you start making steps to actually put it into practice. So mm -hmm. uh, the organization that would happen to build the coalition to help push this to the government. Mm -hmm. And then shaping the law would be that last step with the march. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Would anybody add to that? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, once they Who's identified that? the law, Oh, this is Jory. Hey, Jory. Uh, once they identified the law, actually having their voices heard and marching mm -hmm. in unity uh, mm -hmm. to attempt to make change um, mm -hmm. is kind of those last steps. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Part of the shaping, sh part of the shaping process is coming together at that national level and, and not just saying we want our own applications process, but we want you to set up the structures that the law requires so that communities all across the country can receive their rights. That was really um, they were kind of shifting there from not just working on their own cases, but, but um, asking for um, a, a kind of structural change, which I would put in the shape law bucket. Um, there are a couple bits more, I think, that are implicit in the story, if anyone else wants to add. Um, I think also there's no law, like... Could you just... End. Is that Audrey? Yeah. Hi, Audrey. Audrey. Yes, go ahead. Um, at the end of the story, because you have all these people now participating with her and getting mm. attention. And so now the knowing law is spreading to everyone. Mm -hmm. Sees that. Mm -hmm. Yes, the knowledge of the law, definitely, in part because there's so much media attention. A lot more people are talking about the Community Land Act. A lot of people who had never heard of it were suddenly discussing it. Absolutely. The, anybody else want to want to jump in? The other two bits that I was going to add was um, on using law, when they, a key part of using law for Matito and for this community in Legurama was following the steps that the law laid out. So the law says, if you want to get rights to your lands, the, there's a set of things you need to do. You need to document your boundaries, you need to elect these land management committees, and they need to be one third women, you need to adopt local bylaws. and so. First learning about the law is knowing law, but then following those steps in a way is kind of applying the law in your own life, making use of that law, invoking it to take an action to try to, um, to, try to obtain the rights that you are entitled to. So that, that, that is a portion of the, the use law that was happening. And then on, on the shape law dimension, you guys emphasize that the national march, absolutely. I think that's one of the key ways in which Matito was shaping law. There was one other though. How else was she involved in shaping law in the story? So at the national level, she, you know, she was part of this, um, this collective demand that the government start putting the structures in place to implement the law that it had adopted. And that is certainly shaping law. But there was one other way in which she shaped law in the course of that story. This is like fair warning that you got to listen carefully because I'm going to be asking questions. Anybody? Uh, I think this is Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Go ahead. Uh, was it that she got elected to be on the committee at the at the resolution of all this? So Absolutely. Then she she got elected on forward, the committee. Uh, Say it again. Moving forward, she'll have a part in, in shaping how this is uh, executed. At, at, exactly, at the local level, and in particular, if you guys remember, they, one of the steps was to adopt bylaws for their own land in Lengurama. So at a local level, 
they were supposed to adopt bylaws. And she actually proposed a couple of those bylaws, one involving a fine for people who violated reservations on grazing lands, and another one was a prohibition on building homes close to the river. And so she was literally, you know, introducing new laws for their own community and, and, um, and, and, and was able to advocate for their adoption successfully. So you can shape law at multiple levels. You could do it at the national level, which she did end up doing, but you can also do it, you know, um, in your city or in your, um, the, you know, as local a governance body as you are a part of. And in this case, the community of Lengurama has governance power under this law. So she shaped those local bylaws as well. So there's sort of two dimensions of, of shaping law. Um, so yeah, let me keep going. This, um, this um, illustrates what I like to call the legal empowerment cycle. Um, and that involves what you might call casework on the one hand, which is about knowing and using law, the, the knowing and using the laws that we have as we have them now. Um, and when you do that uh, and, and you try to use the law in your own circumstance, so for example, in her case, she was trying to follow the steps that the law requested of her. Um, it, it teaches you things about how the law is working in practice. And it offers sort of a map when you look at many cases like that. So in, in their case, there were these 11 communities across the country that all tried to follow the steps that the law laid out. Um, when you look across those cases, it, 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 it offers a map of how the system is working in practice. You start to see patterns and trends, and that can be really powerful information from which to demand for improvements to laws and systems. And so that's how casework can build towards systemic change, towards shaping law. Um, and if you do get a structural change, let's say a new policy or a new law or a new commitment from government, those become new provisions, new legal provisions or legal hooks, which, which communities can then invoke in their, to solve their own, their own specific problems. So we, we, we think about it as a cycle rather than a one-way arrow because you know, when you do get a systemic change, um, it often doesn't implement it itself. That's something that you want to then bring back and breathe life into by, by applying it in, the, in, in your own lived problems. Um, and so that, I think, is the dream of legal empowerment, is that we continuously turn this wheel from knowing and using law to shaping law and, and back again. And I, I, you know, I think there's sort of two dimensions to that relationship between casework and systemic change. One is a kind of learning dimension, which I was just referring to, which is that the cases teach you about how systems are working in practice. And one of the basic things they learned in this case was that um, they could follow all the steps, but government had not put the structures in place that were necessary for them to um, submit those applications. That was a basic lesson that came out of, of their of their attempts at knowing and using law. On the, uh, another dimension of that relationship is a kind of movement building. You know, like when we, we started with Matito, she had never heard of the Community Land Act and she felt afraid. She felt afraid of being displaced. By the time she knew and used the law in, in her own community, she just was a lot stronger. Like that, that experience of understanding what the law said taking the steps it required, that gave her the confidence to then show up in Nairobi and say, look, I, I, I'm not going back with this application and I'm demanding that you set up these structures for everyone. I don't, she told me that she, she wouldn't have been able to do that if she hadn't spent the two years of hard work at home. And so there's a kind of, in terms of people's own human agency, knowing and using can be a step stone, step, step stone towards, towards shaping. Um, yeah, legal empowerment cycle. Um, let me see, I'm just looking at my notes. Just to give you a couple of examples of how that legal empowerment cycle has played out in different places. We work with community paralegals in India, for example, and there we work on environmental justice issues. So people who are dealing with unlawful pollution, um, factories that are poisoning their rivers or mines that are destroying the forests where they live. Um, and based on many, many cases, paralegals and communities have come together and used that information to 
advocate for improvements in the environmental laws of the country, including a new set of sand mining regulations um, for the entire country and an improved enforcement mechanism for the coastal regulation body, which, which governs India's long coastline. And one of the powerful things when you, when you turn this wheel from casework to systemic change is that <clears throat> the cases might be reaching hundreds or thousands of people when you get new laws in place, obviously, you know, that, that is shaping the rights of, in India, you know, hundreds of millions of people. So it's one of the ways in which legal empowerment work can really have um, large scale impact. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back with, with more examples as we, as we continue. Um, another thing that I want to touch on is just the idea of community paralegals in particular. Um, you guys are starting to be lawyers, and I should say some of my, some of my best friends are lawyers, like, like Professor Atuahene. I love, I love a lot of lawyers, but we lawyers have limits. We are expensive, typically, and we tend to focus on formal court solutions that are impractical for a lot of the problems people face. And also, our profession, I would, I would submit, has been part of the problem in terms of cloaking law in this sort of expert culture, this very refined technical language that makes it hard for people to understand. I think our profession has been one of the key barriers to legal empowerment. Um, and so, I, you know, I would say without a doubt, and Bernadette and I were talking about this yesterday, without a doubt, lawyers are crucial in the struggle for justice, but lawyers can't do it alone. You know, and if you think about healthcare as an analogy, you would never say that all you needed was doctors for healthcare, right? I mean, and the, the pandemic has made this so clear, you know, that all these people are doing essential work, the nurses, the midwives, the community health workers, the contact tracers, you need that whole vertical network. And yet somehow in law, we have been relying on a single profession. It's as if we were saying that, you know, only doctors would provide healthcare. We do have paralegals, but the paralegals we have uh, tend to be in the back office, almost like assistants to the lawyers. But in terms of the ones who are in the front, working directly with people, um, we have relied on a single profession. And in fact, um, of all the countries I have worked in, here in the United States, the restrictions on the unauthorized practice of law are the most draconian of any country I have ever been in. Um, because in the United States, in most states, you, if you are not a trained lawyer, you can tell your neighbor what the rules say in the abstract. So no law is okay. You can say, here's what the law says, you know. But the moment that you brainstorm with your neighbor about how those rules apply to their specific circumstances, which is sort of the use law dimension, you are committing a crime in almost every state in America called unauthorized practice of law. So I, I think that is um, one of the ways in which, again, the US and the legal profession has really created a barrier to legal empowerment. Um, so, so despite those regulator, regulatory barriers, um, what we have found over the years is that intermediaries like community paralegals can really be a crucial bridge between the formal promises of law on the one hand and real life on the other hand. This is people like Felister, the one who was in that photo to the right of Matito, who was doing that work of explaining what the law says, helping people, walking with them through that process of knowing, using, and shaping. Um, and I, I have been obsessed with community paralegals for like 17 years and working with teams of community paralegals in many different places around the world. I definitely did not invent them though. Community paralegals go back to the 1950s in South Africa. That, that's sort of the origin story during apartheid. And, and paralegals would help Black people, black paralegals would help black people to defend themselves and, and sort of navigate that very draconian and unjust system of apartheid, which had so many rules about what pass you had to have, where you wanted, where you could go at what time, who you could marry, and, and paralegals would help people to sort of navigate those rules. It was many, many years before they could reshape the law. It took many, many years and a lot of blood was shed, but paralegals were helping people to know and use and defend themselves within that unjust legal structure going back to the 1950s. Um, and I would say that the main thing that paralegals do is they, they educate, they organize, and they help advocate. You know, those are the basic methods they have. They're not litigators. They don't 
They don't go to court. They tend not to represent people in, in tribunals, but they educate, they organize, and they help advocate, uh, similar to what Felicia was doing. And so I wanted to, um, I wanted to um, offer a couple of lessons about community paralegals that had emerged from our experience across different countries around the years, over, over the years. But before I do that, um, let me just pause and see if anybody has any, any questions or reflections. Hmm. Shauna, is that how you pronounce it? Do you want to say about more, more about Montana? Sure, yes, that is how you pronounce it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if this is a question or just a reflection, but you know, you're thinking about um, know the law. And I was, I was really just thinking who gets to define the law and then um, who has to obey these laws that are mm -hmm. defined by you know, the, the colonizer. I lived in Montana for eight years and mm -hmm. I primarily worked in um, sexual assault response and a lot of mm -hmm. my clients were native. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just, I saw a lot of injustice there with mm -hmm. kind of um, jurisdictional issues if it happened on a reservation, off a reservation, who was involved. So just, just a reflection, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, one distinction that I would draw I don't know if you guys use the term access to justice at all, but I, I would distinguish between legal empowerment and access to justice. Um, and the distinction is really in this cycle. I think typically when people talk about access to justice, the assumption is, well, the, you know, the institutions and the rules are okay, and we just need to make sure people can access them. You know, we have an access gap, and we just need to make sure people have enough legal services so that they can access the rules we have. And that is just not my assumption, you know, and that is not the assumption of the legal empowerment movement. Many of the rules we have were designed to repress um, and people experience them as a threat for a reason because they are threatening. And so um, the, the premise of legal empowerment is even in those circumstances to defend yourself, to, 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 to try to address injustices that you face, it can be helpful to know and invoke those rules as imperfect as they are. You gotta kind of make what you can do with them. Um, and, 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 I, and I have found that even in very brutal places, there are, where, where the laws are designed to repress, there are provisions in those laws that can be useful to communities. I almost think of it as like a, um, a rock climber where you are looking for even the smallest crevice where you can hang a couple fingers and then pull yourself up and then look again you know that that's almost what the process of um knowing and using the law can be like in a context when the laws themselves are unfair as so you're looking for those little legal levers or those little crevices pro legal provisions that are in 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 your favor that that actually do create some space for pursuing justice but you don't stop there i think access to justice perhaps stops there it stops at the left side of this wheel but legal empowerment is about the whole wheel. It's about taking that experience of knowing and using, coming together with others who are also trying their best to know and use on their own particular problems. And then, and then as a collective, pursuing improvements to the rules and systems and, and, and trying to reshape them. Um, and so I think legal empowerment is about embracing this entire wheel rather than just what you might call the kind of retail side of, um, on the, on the left of, of, of uh, solving problems one at a time and assuming that the institutions and rules are sort of a given. Um, and I think, you know, similarly, in a place like Montana, where there's been such a history of exploitation and broken promises, and there's such a gap between indigenous people's own rules on the one hand and the federal rules on the other hand, part of what needs to happen is like that vital work you were doing, Sean, of helping people to um, navigate the system with respect to sexual assault, was it sexual assault? Um, is like drawing on that case experience. What are we learning from these cases about where these rules are insufficient or they're culturally inappropriate or they're not working and using that experience to try to pursue a change in the system. I'm not saying it's easy, you know, it can take years, um, but it is possible. And Matito showed 
that it was possible. And I've, I've seen this wheel turn in even very, very brutal places like Myanmar, for example, which has been a dictatorship and a genocidal regime. Even there, we are, we are turning this wheel from case versus systemic change. So if you can do it in Myanmar, you can do it in Montana, you can do it in Chicago, um, you can do it everywhere. Um, and anybody else wanna, wanna pose a question or, or offer a reflection? I'll, I'll go ahead and offer a reflection with Jory again. Um, just going along with the paralegals and how, um, you know, not only lawyers should have uh, this access, you know, to justice and things like that. Uh, a friend of mine was a legal observer uh, for mm -hmm. protests in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, my friend has no legal background, but wanted to somehow, uh, you know, support justice, uh, particularly against police brutality. So, you know, that's a way... Um, that she was trained as a volunteer. Love it, um, yeah. And just, yeah, just observed and assisted uh, by taking mm -hmm. notes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, I mean, I think the law should be for all of us, you know? It shouldn't just be for a single profession. And um, I love these different spaces where we are able to open it up. Um, another cool example in the United States that is allowed because of a Supreme Court case in the 1960s, Avery versus Johnson, anyone read Avery versus Johnson. Um, it was a Supreme Court case that, that was about jailhouse lawyering uh, because the state of Tennessee said, wait a minute, why are there these prisoners who have no legal training who are helping other prisoners to file claims and to appeal their sentences? And how can they do that? They don't have legal training. That's unauthorized practice of law. That's illegal. What do you, what do you, what do you think you're doing in the law library? Um, and the Supreme Court was like, Tennessee, <laughs> you, you provide nothing in the, by way of legal support to indigent prisoners after they are convicted. I mean, I think it was actually, this was pre-Gideon, because in fact, I think the, the justice who wrote Gideon argued Avery. So it was pre-Gideon. So at that point, you didn't even necessarily have a lawyer um, in your trial, but you definitely did not have access to a lawyer once you were convicted. So like a post-conviction appeal, or an issue with pr abuse within the prison, all kinds of legal problems that you might have, or a civil issue that you're experiencing while you're in prison because you're getting, your family is getting evicted because you're in prison. There was no provision of any form of legal support to prisoners. And so the Supreme Court said, when you're not, when you're not, when these people have no way of accessing legal support, how are you gonna deny them the ability to help each other? How, how are you gonna say that um, one prisoner can't help another in, in representing themselves. And so since then, jailhouse lawyering has proliferated. And any prison in the United States, you will find law clerks um, who are prisoners, who, are, who are, do not have formal legal training, but, but know the law better than many lawyers and are helping hundreds and hundreds of other prisoners to exercise their rights. So that's another example of like community paralegalism, you know, legal empowerment that has managed to uh, flourish in the United States despite the draconian um, unauthorized practice of law regulations. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we need to open law up. That is, that is the spirit of legal empowerment. Um, anybody else wanna, want to uh, jump in? I see some, there was some chat about the, um, oh, someone's a paralegal. De Deborah, do you wanna say more about your experience? I know that we sometimes are <laughs> better than some. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No shade, she says. Yeah, it's you true. I work you know. in the immigration field, and sometimes, yeah. you know, we know more than some of the attorneys that have been there since the mm -hmm. 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important to maybe, you know, begin the conversation about having paralegals either have more training or mm -hmm. allow them to help the community a little more because sometimes people are afraid to talk to attorneys. Mm -hmm. uh, it may it might be the language barrier it might be well i won't understand what the attorney is going to mm -hmm. say to me or mm -hmm. um it's just a scary experience to say i have to go speak to an attorney so it might mm -hmm. be better to have somebody else do it mm -hmm. love it um there's this guy of a friend of mine named raj jayadev who's totally a legal empowerment guy he founded something called participatory defense and um it's all about supporting um, families and communities to be a part of the criminal defense process. He, he, he describes how 
when you, you could have a whole, you could have 10 family and community members in a room um, with, along with a family member who is a defendant in some sort of criminal case. The moment the lawyer walks in the room, you could see the energy of the room change and you could see the like eyes of everybody turn towards the lawyer. They're all sort of hanging on, um, hanging on, what's the word? Or, or uh, hanging on what? Hang, hanging on tender hooks and kind of leaning, their, their body language, everything is sort of um, looking to the lawyer as the savior, you know? And, and he has been trying to turn that dynamic around and pack courtrooms so that, that, um, that, that there are family members and community members present during sentencing, during trial, um, offer these social biographies so juries and judges can see more of the, the broader life of someone who was accused of a crime and they don't just see them in this one very narrow light. Um, and basically to bring a kind of collective organizing perspective into what is otherwise a very individual process of, um, of, of, of criminal prosecution. Um, and and Deborah, your, your, your reflection on your experience as a paralegal, that is a good segue to what I wanted to talk about next. Let me try to get back to my slides here. Um, which is, I wanted to offer some lessons from our experience about community paralegals, which relates to what you're saying, Deborah, about um, maybe we need to vamp up the training. You know, how, how do we support these intermediaries to play a more robust role? Um, and some of the lessons, some of the lessons that we have learned, one is it's crucial to have a vertical network. You know, you, you don't want to have just lawyers, just like you wouldn't want to have only doctors, but you do need lawyers in the picture. So it would be dangerous. And I do see this happening around the world. If you just kind of train community paralegals for a couple weeks, give them a certificate, and then send them on their way and say, good luck. Now, that, that is dangerous. You, you could do more harm than good that way. What, one of the things we have found is that for community paralegals to be effective, they need to be a part of a vertical network. Just like a nurse is connected to a hospital and a doctor, similarly, a community paralegal needs to be connected to, to lawyers, to movement allies, um, to political allies, so that they can take on these imbalances of power. So they're not left alone to fight by themselves, but they are part of something bigger um, that that is necessary for them to be able to win and for them to be able to be rigorous in the way that they um, help people to understand and use the law. Uh, otherwise, you, yeah, you, you have the risk of kind of doing more harm than good. So that, that, that's one big lesson. Um, another one, come on now, okay, an, another one is, um, the that we have seen great potential in administrative institutions. Deborah, you mentioned working in the immigration context. Those are those are administrative institutions, land administrative agencies like the one I'm describing in Kenya. A lot of housing is is administrative, um, which I know has been the focus of your course. Uh, healthcare access is administrative. So much um, uh, social security and other kinds of entitlements are administrative. So much of life happens in these administrative institutions and you don't necessarily need a lawyer to go before them, though they can be corrupt, they can be opaque. Um, and so when community paralegals can help people to go before those institutions on their own often, um, but with greater knowledge of what the rules say and greater ability to invoke those rules, we can often, we, we find that we can often squeeze justice out of those systems. And so I think a lot of law focuses on the courts, a lot of legal empowerment focuses on the administrative institutions as, as a sort of fertile ground where people can engage directly. <clears throat> and, and when they are empowered, they can do so successfully. The EPA is another example. There's lots of environmental administrative institutions, the institutions that give out ID cards, which are crucial if you wanna vote, for example. Many, many different administrative institutions that, that really shape our lives and that create an opportunity for legal empowerment. Um, and then a third lesson that I was going to mention is just that legal empowerment has to be adapted to context. What you do in rural Kenya is not the same that you do at the border in Texas or um, among uh, indigenous communities in Montana or with respect to police abuse in Chicago. Like e each context is unique and um, there, there, there is a clear core approach and a core vision um, and a core set of principles, but the 
specifics need to be adapted based on 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 the the specific problem, the specific circumstances, the specific communities. Um, that is another crucial lesson that we have learned over the years. This is not community paralegal. It's not a little recipe that you can kind of replicate from place to place. You got to kind of figure it out how it works in a given situation. Um, so you know what I wanted to do was I wanted to go back to those personal experiences. And Bernadette is right. There's so many rich ones that came through. Um, uh, some of you guys described them verbally, and then some of you wrote them on here. Can you can you reimagine those? Go back to those stories of injustice, um, and imagine that there was a community paralegal in the story. You know, Ma imagine that there was greater legal empowerment in the story. How might it have gone differently? And maybe just take a moment to think about that, or jot down a few lines, and then I will um, ask if someone wants to to share. Could you repeat that? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, 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 we at the outset, were, I was asking everybody to um, remember an injustice that they had encountered, that it, they had experienced themselves or they had witnessed or that it happened to someone that was close to them. And we, and we talked in particular about what role law played in those um, experiences. And what I'm asking now, having had this discussion about Matito and her experience and about community paralegals and about the three transformations of legal empowerment. What I'm asking you guys to do now is go back to these, those same experiences and rewrite history a little bit. Reimagine re those experiences. Um, what would they have looked like if, if say there was a community paralegal in the room or, or present, you know, if there was a community paralegal available during that, during that key moment, um, what, 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 would those, what would those experiences have looked like if there was greater legal empowerment? How, how would that make a difference? Is that, is that clear? Question clear? Yes, thank you. And Leah said, you know, I'm, I'm sure the individuals have a greater sense of confidence and peace. Yeah. Does anybody want to um, get even more specific about how in that specific situation that you were remembering, how might it go down otherwise? Uh, Vivek, I don't know if you can see, but Alexander has her hand raised. Oh, I, I, I can't see that. Please, Alexander, go for it. Thank you. Um, so in my specific instance, the community paralegal would help in the sense that parents would be able to know that mm. they could have these aids in the classroom with their, with their child. Can you remind us what your, what your story was? I, yeah, I, you know, I worked at Equip for Equality um, and we learned that a lot of students with uh, special needs and disabilities Mm. being arrested because they um, had these episodes that resulted from over simulation or something that had happened mm. during that day. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these students though don't have AIDS which would be helpful for them because their AIDS would know how to calm them down, have techniques for de-escalation um, and manners in that way. And parent, a lot of parents don't know that they can have these aids and so if there were to be a community paralegal that mm. were to tell them you these are your rights this is how you could advocate for yourself so in that instance the police would not had to have even come because they would have had aids in the classroom to calm those situations down because the teachers in that in that sense don't have the time to calm down one student when there are other mm. ten of students in the classroom as well. Right, love it. I love that example. It's, I mean, it's sort of similar to the Community Land Act where it was sitting there on the books, but the people who need it the most didn't know about it. Um, yes, and, 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 and so, you know, there's this provision around the right to these aids, but people didn't know about it. And a community imperative would make sure that those folks are able to um, access that. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great, terrific example. Um, looks like Deborah wanted to share. 
Go ahead, Deborah. Ah, thanks. Yeah, just going back to my example about volunteering at the border, the detention center. Uh, so most of these women did not know that they, they would have uh, an interview most likely the next morning. They would get there mm -hmm. at 5 a.m. Their interview was 8 a.m. the same day or the following day. Mm -hmm. um, and they would talk to these asylum officers and they would just go into like their whole story, their whole life story, and the asylum officers would cut them off after 10, 15 minutes. So being there and just being able to talk, talk them through the interview, let them know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, just making sure that they hit the most important points and to keep it, you know, short and sweet in, in a way right. um, that just made a world of difference. And we mm. definitely started to see more more approvals and more positive stories. Wow. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. And it's so needed that the, the, the situation on the border is so dire. And yeah, it's been crazy. coaching, a little bit of legal power can go a long way. And it sounds like you were engaging that yourself. And we, you know, we weren't even, you know, explaining the law or anything anything just making sure that they knew what their rights were and mm. to tell their story in a way that was that was helpful mm -hmm. yeah love that love, love that example so necessary um olivia tell us about property tax code because that's something that's close to Bernadette's heart yeah i guess it's just top of mind but um just relating it to that i guess all week we're thinking about um what we can do, what changes can be made. So I was thinking like the world of difference that could be taken if these homeowners who need that knowledge um, could have access to community paralegals, um, empowering them and um, making them confident and also making them knowledgeable to see what their options are. And also I see it as sort of like a domino effect if mm. um, the steps that you'd mentioned of if they um, know the law, then, mm -hmm. then there's a domino effect, then they can use the law, then they can mm -hmm. shape the law themselves mm -hmm. with those community paralegals empowering them to do so. Excellent, yeah. I do think of it as a journey, I, I, you know, where knowing can be a step towards using and using can be a step towards coming together with others and collectively attempting to shape. Um, and I, I think that's a really, powerful journey that that um that that we want to catalyze you know all, all over the place and that we want to engage in ourselves i mean i think of myself on that journey um as well <clears throat> it's one more person looks like um joe you you wrote in and you had, you had shared earlier about the experience of seeing police officers beat protesters. So yeah, but what would you say going back to that? <clears throat> well, I was just thinking it's in a way, it's an example of a situation where there is something sort of like a community paralegal as, as you, um, mm -hmm. you know, were discussing earlier. Um, and because uh, there are legal observers. Um, and I guess in a way, maybe there is some violence that's, that's uh, prevented by the the existence of mm. that, those those people mm -hmm. um, but, but the other thing that happens is that there's maybe a little help on the back end um, mm. where they're able to send in lawyers after them once they're taken once people are taken to jail um, mm -hmm. and there's at least a little bit more information it's maybe um, yeah uh, but I, I'm, I'm sure there's there's more that could be done there too mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think sometimes what we have is um, observers or organizers who are providing information, so they're focusing on the no law part. One of the steps that I think could be really powerful, but again, you need to be careful to not violate those unauthorized practices of law regulations, which are pretty draconian. But if you can navigate your way around them, um, the next step of going further than just hear what your rights are to actually, well, let's walk together. Let me help you apply those rules to actually get a solution in your case or to defend defend yourself against um, against police excess in, in, in your example. Uh, I think that next step is oftentimes a crucial one and is what differentiates legal empowerment from, say, uh, just legal awareness, uh, if that makes sense. Um, I was going to I was going to say something about um, what does all this mean for you guys who are future lawyers? You know, Deborah was a paralegal back in the day, but now she's going to be a lawyer in a couple of years. What does this mean for you guys? Um, I, do, I definitely don't want to say 
that legal empowerment is just for community paralegals. No way. I think all of us should be engaging in legal empowerment. And as lawyers, we can depart from the history of our profession um, and we can rather work with a legal empowerment attitude and legal empowerment mindset. And so we can, when, when we do our work as lawyers, we can think about demystifying the law, making it simple, equipping people to use it themselves, you know, not, not just to be serving on their behalf or advocating on their behalf, but strengthening their ability to advocate for themselves, make the law simple, help them use it themselves, help them come together to shape the law. I think these are things that every single lawyer can and should embrace um, as a sort of way of working. And then moreover, seek out community paralegals and, and collaborate with them. You know, you need that vertical network. You can be part of that vertical network. Don't work alone as lawyers. Don't simply have paralegals in the back office. Try to find a way to collaborate with a front line of intermediaries. Maybe they are organizers who have, who, who you provide some training to them in law. Um, maybe they are paralegals like Deborah, but you kind of beef up the role that they play as paralegals. Maybe they are observers like the ones that Joe was mentioning. But again, you know, the, the skills and the, and the capacity of those observers is increased. But I, I would encourage you guys, as you become lawyers, to seek out and collaborate with um, uh, the equivalent of community paralegals, community legal workers. And they can go by many different names. Um, so I, I was going to close, and, and then we'll have some more time for discussion. I was going to close. Vivek, before you close, we have some really good ideas going on in the chat here. OK, let's check uh, it out. Shiny, Shiny, can you speak up? Because yours is really interesting. She's thinking about how we use community empowerment in the space of racial profiling. And some of her ideas are more, be, what can we do beyond educating people? Mm -hmm. So Shiny's like, you know, her position, again, Shiny, speak up. but. It's about education, but mm -hmm. how do we take legal empowerment beyond education? Mm -hmm. Shiny, go ahead. What was your original scenario, Shiny? And then, um, and then how was your rewriting of your scenario? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was just kind of talking about how um, before the world shut down, I really like to travel. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I've traveled quite a bit and especially around Europe there's not a lot of people of color in Europe so every time I took a flight um I kid you not every time I boarded a flight um I was always getting like randomly like you know pulled aside and it would be even the process would take even longer if I was like especially wearing clothing that weren't wasn't like western clothing so mm -hmm. like um, I don't want to assume your ethnicity, but like I'm Indian and I I'm wear I'm like Gujarati. I bet you're Gujarati. I'm Gujarati. Yeah, of course you are. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got very excited. Um <laughs> so like, you know, I I like wear a lot of like um Indian clothing. I mean it's comfortable, you know, especially mm -hmm. when you're traveling and stuff. Yeah. But whenever I was so wearing like it, like Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And especially mm -hmm. when I was wearing it, like in the airports in Europe, it was like always getting pulled aside. And so I was like, all right, you know what, I'm just gonna wear some leggings and a sweatshirt. <laughs> and, um, and I just, when I think of, so then when uh, Professor was saying, okay, now how does everybody apply legal empowerment? Mm -hmm. I was really having a hard time thinking mm -hmm. about that. What does that. it look like in that scenario? Right. Right. Because, um, so like for me, for an example, like I know that there's racial profiling going on or some sort of profiling, right? Like I can see it. You can't really describe why, but it's just one of those things when you're in the moment, you know, it's happening. Like, it's yeah. like if I'm the only brown person on the flight and I'm, I see myself in line about to board and I'm the only one being pulled aside. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like it's there, but how, like, like. I feel like a lot of people in that situation, especially I'm thinking about like my family members who aren't, you know, I'm first generation. So like, yeah. I, like th they don't speak a lot of English and if they're traveling, you know, they're trying to stay out of trouble, right? If you get pulled yeah. aside, you get pulled aside and you just yeah. keep your head down. You do what they tell you and you keep going. Yeah. So I find that there's a comparison between like, you know, airports and um, the way uh, black people in America experience mm -hmm. the police, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's wrong, but you're, like you're not gonna actually do anything in the mm -hmm. moment because you're scared for your life right yeah. and in yeah. my situation it's not necessarily that i'm scared for my life it's just like i'm just trying to get on my flight you know yeah. so 
Um, so I guess I don't know how legal empowerment would work. I mean, maybe seeing whether or not like for people like that are older and don't know that TSA is or is not allowed to do something. I mean, how do you tell those people that, okay, well, they can randomly search, but mm -hmm. like they can't do certain things. So like, how yeah. do you, how, do you get what I'm trying to say? Yes, I do. I do. And I, and I think this is helpful because it's through the examples that we can start to get concrete about all of this. Um, let's take both of those. Let's take both um, the sort of uh, racial profiling that we see um, in the States by the police and the uh, airport and, and the airport example, which is real life. I mean, that, that's happened to me too a lot. Um, uh, on the airport one, you know, Europe has very stringent rules against profiling on the books. Um, and it has one of the most progressive legal regimes with respect to racial profiling. So imagine if there was a community paralegal posted up at the airport who said, um, who, who was just able to counsel people on what those rules say. And when they encountered something that they thought was unfair, they could be right there with that person, not to represent them like a lawyer would, but to help them represent themselves and help, help them to invoke the rules in real time um, and help to make sure that the officials in the airport were abiding by those rules. Um, and then another key piece that gets you from knowing and using to shaping is if those paralegals were tracking data on every case that they encountered. So they see thousands of people going through over the course of six months, you know, they might work with a thousand people each. Um, that allows them to see patterns of how those rules are being implemented or not being implemented, being violated, where the rules might be falling up short. And so you could potentially use that information and come together with some of the folks who have experienced profiling to attempt to reshape and improve those rules. And so that's one of the ways in, you, in which you could try to turn that wheel. Um, you know, obviously not, 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 not easy. Easy, easy, easier said than done. I mean, there's all kinds of challenges you could imagine. One being that if you were from the States and you were just passing through, you might not really want to, you know, might not really have the time to get involved in trying to reshape the rules, you know, but maybe it sounds like that experience stuck with you. So maybe if they called you um, afterwards, you actually would be willing to testify. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I even said in my, um, when I was writing in the chat, so like mm. my roommate at the time, she's like my best friend and she's, you know, she's very, I mean, she's Irish, so she's white and you know, blonde mm -hmm. hair and, um, she, it was almost like a dark joke between us because I traveled mm -hmm. a lot more than she did. And so like, mm -hmm. I'd come home from the airport and you know, if you, your bag gets randomly searched, they have mm -hmm. to put like this little tag inside of your bag that says your mm -hmm. bag's been searched. And literally like, I think one year no, I, I took like that. 16 flights and there was 14 tags in my bag <laughs> by the end of the year. And mm -hmm. so it got to be a joke. Like literally every time I opened up my suitcase and I saw a tag, I would put a magnet to the fridge with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so by the end of the year on the fridge, there was 14 tags from TSA saying your bag got searched. And she was like, I always thought you were joking when you said mm -hmm. you got searched this much. Mm -hmm. I was like, "What? no, like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm safe, but like, this is definitely not normal, you know, like mm -hmm. you travel, like, do you see like the tags right. in your bags? And she's like, no. Like, and so if you had paralegals who are working with many, many people like you, you could then build up a, a data-based case to show that what you are experiencing anecdotally is actually a trend. Uh, so that's one of the powers of legal empowerment is that by working on many cases, no use, no use, no use, you end up getting... A, a picture of how the system is working in practice. And that can be very compelling as a way of um, challenging that system. Um, and I think Tule has a great point okay, too. Let's go to Tule. Her example was about unequal schools, unequal mm -hmm. funding in schools. Okay. And we're in the chat trying to think through okay. how does legal empowerment improve that situation? Go ahead, Tule. Tell us, Tule. Share it with the group. You guys are over having your side conversation. <laughs> Sorry, my cat was meowing, so I didn't hear what you asked. Can I hear it again? Oh, I was just saying, please share with us um, your original scenario as well as how you're thinking about um, how legal empowerment could fit in. Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland, and I went to high school there. Um, so from ninth to 11th grade. And uh, the biggest thing when I moved to Kentucky, I noticed that the lack of 
any sort of access. The original school that I went to in Baltimore, they only had maybe two AP classes. There were broken desks. There weren't any new textbooks. Like they were falling mm. apart. The mm. equipment was terrible. There wasn't really a college preparedness air in the in the school. But mm -hmm. as soon as I went to um, my new school, it was like mm -hmm. college was the one thing that everyone knew that you would go to. There were opportunities for you to be able to even go to a college and take a college class on that campus. And mm -hmm. that was something I didn't hear about mm -hmm. um, until I moved. So it was such a whole new world for me. And mm -hmm. I didn't know how to take it, kind of. Like, it kind of just felt like everything was over my head. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I also noticed, I mean, when you're in a situation like that, when you're in in your city, I mean, it's kind of just like it is what it is people don't really understand that there is other options for them. Because I mean, like, if that's mm -hmm. what your parents went through, or if your parents didn't go to school, and then mm -hmm. your grandparents didn't, if you're like first gen, you mm -hmm. don't really know where the money's coming from, people don't talk mm -hmm. to you about scholarships. So mm -hmm. there's just so much. And I feel as though if at least people from higher backgrounds came down and like talk to these people and talk to the mm -hmm. students and mm -hmm. let them know their options, let them know that things can change. Um, I feel as though people would be in a much better spot. I just think that there just needs to be more education. People need mm -hmm. to know that there are options out there. Mm -hmm. So, but if they don't know, nothing can happen. Mm -hmm. So we have to first start off with true education before we mm -hmm. can start anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yes. And there, there are rules on the books that relate to equitable educational access. Um, there are federal student loan programs. There are scholarship programs. There are some requirements for public schools that receive state or federal funding about the kinds of opportunities they're supposed to provide their students. And so I could definitely imagine the equivalent of a community paralegal um, among the students, you know, it could be a student, him or herself or their self who um, learns what these rules say and becomes a resource so that other students can make sure that they're able to access what, what it is that they're entitled to. And again, to your point, Bernadette, about not, ju not just stopping with legal awareness, but really taking that extra step from no to use, um, that can be that can mean, you know, not just, you know, giving people a pamphlet or letting people know in the abstract what the rules say, but helping them use those rules to solve a problem they are facing. Um, so let's say to apply for uh, a, a, a student loan that they qualify for, um, or maybe even to challenge um, a neglectful, a negligent um, practice by the school administration, you know, by going to the Board of Ed, for example, you know, there, there, there are routes students have for redress, uh, but those can be opaque. And so it, it can be powerful to have someone to walk alongside with you. I did want to make sure we <laughs> to discuss. I mean, I did say that education is important, but overwhelming. I also mm. think mentorship is really important. Mm. I mean, I think just having education is great, but if you don't, if these students don't have someone to look up to, someone mm. that they know that they can always look up to and talk to and just mm. have someone on their side, especially when they are moving up the ladder, when mm. there are so little opportunities for minorities and immigrants, like my parents are immigrants, like I didn't have any, anyone in my family who went to law school or mm. anyone in my community. So it was kind of just like by myself, but mm -hmm. I greatly would have benefited if I did have a mentor who came from the same background as me could lead me through that way. And I think as long as we have more opportunities for mentorship, especially for people of color, I think a lot of good change could happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I appreciate that, Sule. I, I agree. Um, I did want to share with you guys, just bringing this back to the housing context, which is the focus of this course. Um, and it's such an, it's such a um, essential issue to be talking about right now because there are millions and millions of people being evicted um, in the United States <clears throat> as we speak uh, because of joblessness caused by the pandemic and either holes in the mor moratoriums that have been issued or expiration of the moratoriums in some places. Um, so it's such a, such a vital topic to be paying attention to. I, um, I meant to put a slide on this. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Um, there was a, basically a community paralegal program in New York City that, that a judge approved, which is how it got around the unauthorized practice of law regulations, 
where there were non-lawyer advocates. Some of them were actually volunteers. Some of them were paid, um, but they were, they were non-lawyer advocates who were in housing court and they would help people to navigate their way through housing court to understand what goes into um, a response to an eviction notice, to understand the process, to understand um, with a sequence of events and, and, and just a little bit of coaching and, and support for navigating that process. And there's a woman named um, Rebecca Sandifer who's um, indigenous herself and, and recently won a MacArthur Award for her research on access to justice. She evaluated this program and her and her colleague looked at 150 cases in which tenants had help from these paralegals. Again, not, not lawyers, just these non-lawyer advocates who were in the housing court. And normally in New York City, about one in nine tenants who gets brought to housing court would get evicted. That was kind of the ambient rate of eviction in New York City at the time of the evaluation a couple years ago, one in nine. Out of the 150 they looked at, zero evictions. Not a single family was evicted. And so that suggests that a little bit of legal empowerment can go a long way. I mean, I think of Deborah, you were saying like a little bit of coaching could help people be more successful in those asylum interviews. Um, a little bit of legal empowerment can go a long way. So I do think there are huge opportunities um, to do this work uh, across many of the justice issues that are exploding right now because of the pandemic.